Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the industry launch of the revised Class 1 heavy vehicle access regime. Uh, my name is Scott Walker. I'll be IMC today, um, hosting you through a few speakers we have to join us along the way. Uh, today, we would like to introduce the revised Class 1 access regime uh, program to you all um, and give you an update of how you can be involved and be in, um, in consultation with us and give you an update of what we're up to, what the program means and the background that comes with that. We will be taking questions throughout the day. Those questions will be moderated by the program team and they will be providing answers where we can. Where a question is a little bit more technical in nature and, and, and we can't answer that question, then the program team will work through that uh, probably throughout the remainder of the week and into next week and provide responses where we can uh, back to you. So if we're able to provide a response today, we will. If it's a little bit more technical in nature, then the program team will, will take that away and give you a response as time goes on. Uh, throughout today, um, we will, the, the chat will be turned off um, as will cameras and mics just to help keep the noise down um, and, and help get the focus on to um, some of the messaging that we would like to get to you and we'll show you how you can become involved later on. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge uh, the traditional owners um, of the lands which we're on today. So the Turbul, uh, Jagera and Yangara peoples and traditional owners, custodians of the land in which we gather today, and the elders, past, present, and emerging. What I'll do now uh, for you is just share you with you a video just to give you an understanding of who we are as a department, um, and then we will progress on from there. Mate, took the time. Where'd you get this vest from? <laughs> Not yours, is it? <laughs> Take it back. <laughs> okay, today, um, pretty uh, straightforward agenda, but some very interesting, exciting topics we'd like to discuss with you. So, um, First of all, we started off with the welcome um, and reminder that the, the questions will be available in the Q&A box at the top of the screen. So if you click on there and, and type any questions you have as we go along, um, they'll either be actioned by the program team or forwarded along to a, a business, another business unit if um, it's something for them to address and someone will get back to you. Uh, today we're covering off several topics. 
um, as we go through and we have a couple of people to in to speak with us. We, uh, have the, the accompaniment of Jeff McGoffin and Dennis Walsh who have graciously uh, put their time to presenting to you today. Um, so we will get straight into it and get started. And I'd like to hand over to Jeff McGoffin. Yeah, thank you, Scott, and good morning, uh, everyone uh, online today. Uh, I'm very pleased to be launching uh, this very exciting project looking into uh, the new Class 1 heavy vehicle access regime. Uh, I too would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land in which we uh, virtually uh, gathered today, uh, elders past, present and emerging. Uh, today I want to take the opportunity to give you all an insight to why we need to review the current uh, Class 1 vehicle access regime and to let you know about the exciting project that is uh, underway to develop a new uh, a uh, new access regime that delivers safe and sustainable uh, access to our network while working uh, with industry to identify how we can provide you with the information tools to make uh, informed business decisions. Let me uh, start by acknowledging the critical role of the Class 1 heavy vehicle uh, that they play uh, in supporting and growing the uh, Queensland economy. Freight movement, both large and small, supports communities, jobs uh, and overall growth of the state. TMR's role is to facilitate this access in a way that is both safe and sustainable on our network, and we must be innovative in balancing the growing demands of the Class 1 heavy vehicle movements with existing constraints of our network uh, and our constrained funding environment. When I talk about constraints of our network, I'm mostly talking about our structures. TMR's network includes uh, over 3,100 bridges, and these bridges range uh, in age from 100 years old uh, to recently constructed. Over the past 100 years, uh, engineering design requirements have changed relative to the needs of the fleet at, at the time. While, while about half of our network is designed for a three axle, 33 tonne trucks or less, 15% of TMR's bridges, uh, current bridge stock, uh, 500 odd bridges, are built to, to the current design standard. These, will, these, these have been built over the past 20 years and equate to one being constructed every two weeks. Class 1 heavy vehicles, including low loaders, load platforms and special purpose vehicles, represent less than 1% of the overall heavy vehicle movements uh, across the state network. However, they do present the biggest challenge in ensuring safe and sustainable access across our structures. As I outlined, the majority of our bridges are not designed to manage these loads. We have undertaken a significant amount of work to understand the potential loads our bridge assets can manage relative to their respective engineering uh, design standards to help us understand how far we, we can safely sweat our assets. Now that we have a better understanding of how far we can push our assets safely and sustainably, we need to use this as a basis to, uh, for access uh, moving forward. We are also conscious of how we work uh, with industry as our customers on how we can better uh, share the information to help you make assessments, uh, make your own assessments on what you can move where. We need to get this information online as soon as possible, as, as we can and over time uh, establish an interactive capability so we can better assist your planning uh, and when you are quote, quoting on jobs. If we step back for a minute and look at the current access regime, we can see there's been significant changes in both the types of vehicles and frequency of movements since it was brought into effect in the early 80s. This diagram shows key milestones in access regime history and the types of vehicles that we are using in the network at the time. Essentially, these highlights uh, that the current access of Class 1 vehicles in Queensland is based on allowable mass tables developed in the 80s. At this time, Class 1 vehicles were rare and infrequent, and measures to control movements were in place. Many of today's vehicles don't, don't exist. Uh, where we have uh, advanced our structural engineering knowledge of our assets, we, we know that the vehicle fleet has become much larger and heavier, and Class 1 vehicles are no longer rare and infrequent. We need to consider that what this means now, and that we have, uh, now that we have that knowledge. These factors highlight 
the need to revise the current access regime to ensure a safe and sustainable access to TMR structures for all road users into the future. So now that I've introduced the issue we face, I'm pleased to give you an overview of how we plan to move forward. Today, we are introducing a revised Class 1 Heavy Vehicle Access Regime Program. We have put together a team of dedicated staff from across the different areas of TMR to ensure we manage this challenge through uh, best practice engineering and industry collaboration. The team will develop a, a, a sorry. The team will need to develop a safe and sustainable access regime that is supported by sound engineering and structural assessment. The team will be driven uh, by seeing whatever we can do to support access whilst meeting the engineering and safety obligations. In addition to the new access regime, the project has been tasked with delivering improved systems and processes for managing class one vehicle access to reduce delays, increased transparency and certainty across access, about access and allowing transport companies to better plan their movements, better use of technology to ensure compliance and a level playing field for industry, and better support decision-making by the road asset owner. Our uh, Director General and Executive Leadership Team have significant interest in the success of this project and we are receiving regular updates on the progress. We believe that there are significant benefits for industry in, in the planned deliverables for the project. We also acknowledge that any changes to access have potential impacts that need to be understood by us all. Vehicle configurations and load uh, indivisibility uh, may need to be reconsidered and alternative routes found to ensure everyone continues to have safe access to the network. The project team will be working together with industry to explore the types of vehicle types we want to use and we'll test these vehicle types against our assets and whether those assets can support it. When we have a better understanding of this, we may uh, mean uh, this may mean the team will work together with you to develop a, a suite of tools that deliver upfront transparent information that you can use when quoting haulage jobs and applying for permits. The engineering is based on science and we now have that knowledge at, at uh, an individual structural level. Public safety has always been our number one priority, so we, we will have some new constraints on some of our bridges, but we have a duty of care to take appropriate actions. I hope you understand we, we need to drive this project forward and will we'll join us in the spirit intended to work collaboratively to mitigate any negative impacts where possible. I also hope you can share our vision for a new access regime that ensures sustainable, sustainable access into the future that is supported by a type of information that will allow industry more certainty when planning uh, their own business operations. Thank you, and I'd like to now introduce my esteemed colleague, Dennis Walsh. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, and uh, thanks, Scott, for, for chairing today. And um, good morning, everybody. Uh, look, I uh, also would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, their elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. Um, so I'll um, build on what Jeff has given an overview of and, and provide a little bit more detail, I suppose, around both the program itself and some of the challenges that we need to, to address and and then also, um, you know, where we might go to from here. Uh, so with that, um, Jeff provided the, some insights um, and I'll just pop up that slide again. Um, so thanks for that. Um, so Jeff provided some insights on our current bridges on our network and these bridges have been engineered to take different loads depending on when they are constructed. So um, you would call the the, um, the table that you showed earlier. So in summary, we have um, significant differences in the capacity or the carrying capacity of our various um, bridges, the 3,100 odd that we have on the network. So continuing to make access decisions based on the current regime has the potential for overstressing and stru structural fatigue on some of our bridges. So that's really the some of the challenge that we face now with the knowledge that we have. So this morning, I'd firstly like to reflect on the current access regime and what underpinned its development. So if we go back to 1981, when this, when the class one regime 
really emerged, and I know that's a long time ago, but uh, that's um, that's the the genesis of the current regime. We had some low loaders, and um, we had virtually no platforms in the heavy vehicle fleet. Um, then, when we started out back then, the regime um, had specific lists of bridges with a blanket operating condition of centerline travel and a speed limit of 10 kilometres an hour. Then if we look at um, how it progressed to 1987, um, with the advent of including it into the uh, internal document within TMR, which many of you will probably have um, heard of, the Vehicle Limits Manual, there are additional conditions that were brought in to manage risk to the structures. And that included, um, if a load was divisible, it had to be broken down, Operators were required to report on all routes that they travelled on at the end of the permit period. Um, a requirement was um, that no other freight vehicle could be on the structure at the same time as the um, Class 1 vehicle. Um, slow speed, centerline travel, etc. So there was a range of other measures that were in place uh, to manage that impact on the bridges. TMR have actively, actively reviewed period permit and renewals and limiting access to suitable routes only during that period. And in regards to cranes, we only had truck mounted uh, cranes operating at that time. If we bring ourselves forward now to today, um, we've got all terrain cranes that have been introduced. Uh, class one vehicle movements are, are now more frequent, as we know. Platform, platforms have almost become the vehicle of choice. Risk control measures are fewer. Um, platforms um, run in lane rather than down the center line of the bridge. We have evidence that loads are not always being broken down where they can be. And um, clearly we're getting some overstressing occurring on a regular basis of our bridges. So our concern is that this is a pathway to fatigue and serious issues with the integrity of our structures. And as Jeff mentioned, we have an obligation to manage safety for the broader public, um, but it's also about sustaining access for industry as well in the long term. So with this as a backdrop, drop, um, the, and that access for current day vehicles is based on engineering from the 1980s, we do look at what's changed in the engineering space as well. So bridge strength um, was based on mid-span mid bending moment only um, back in the 1980s. Um, other reactions such as a shear and peer reaction were not considered back then as well. So engineering's changed as well. Our engineering understanding has changed and the um, way in which we understand the performance of our bridges, we have a lot more knowledge about. So this combined with the traffic mode changes that have occurred um, is really causing um, a mismatch between our current engineering knowledge and aspects of the current access regime. So the current day conditions are now indivisible load only and single trip only. And the department has, as an asset management, doesn't have, as an asset manager, doesn't have visibility of all the loads that are moving on net, our network, when they're moving, how often they're moving, and at what mass. So that makes it very difficult for us to really have um, a good understanding of what that overstressing is happening in real time on our network, which would help um, in so far as managing those risks to those structures. So it is timely for us to undertake this review of the Class One access regime. So if I move on to the next slide, um, over recent years, TMR has undertaken extensive research, as I've alluded to, um, using contemporary engineering to better understand the structural capacity of our bridges and how these relate to the heavy vehicles that cross them. Based on this work, um, I would like to show you a graph, this graph here that indicates the load effects of class one and class two vehicles on our bridges. Those built to the current engineering standards and those which were built to previous um, older engineering standards. So green, orange, um, green, yellow, orange, and red are the, the, the colors. And as you can probably um, assume, the green zone is on the bars is where the access is sustainable. Um, where we're above that zone, it start, the bridges are starting to be overstressed and access needs to be reviewed and more closely managed. This is not considered sustainable, except for potentially infrequent movements, which we understand need to occur. As you can see, our newer bridges at the top are easily have capacity to sustain and handle current heavy vehicle demands. However, bridges depicted by the bottom bar show that class one vehicles are operating within margin and have significant potential for overstressing and fatiguing our structures. So if we then move to um, looking at a um, 
the actual strains on a bridge in real life. Um, we've had a, um, a instrumentation of the Gateway Arterial Flyover to the north of Brisbane here. Um, we've instrumented that with some strain gauges and we looked at what is actually happening to that bridge in real time. So the graph here shows that the actual bridge response for a four axle 48 ton crane in blue, in the blue line, and a six axle um, crane with the three axle dolly weighing, 40, uh, weighing 80 ton in the orange line. And that's compared to a HMLB double in the green line. And these are the actual real life measurements from our strain gauges on the bridge. And you'll note, that both cranes produce a higher bridge response and therefore stress the bridge more than a HML B double, even though the category two crane has less total mass. So the crane here has a point load effect that I'll explain further in the next slide. So this slide here provides a comparison of the 48 tonne crane with the HML road train on a 10 metre and a 20 metre simply supported bridge. The bridge response changes depending on the span length, type of bridge, whether it's simply supported or continuous, uh, bridge material, age, condition, and a lot of other factors. Bottom line is no bridge is the same. So this is a simple comparison to, to really make a point around, I suppose, uh, what prima facie is a, a more a heavier vehicle um, in, in so far as the HML road train compared to a crane, which is a lighter vehicle, but the, the lighter vehicle can have more impact on the bridge. So you'll note on the 10 metre span that only the triaxle group of the HML road train can fit on the bridge span, hence 22 and a half tonne loading on the bridge. However, due to the compact nature of the 48 tonne crane, the load can fit, all the load can fit onto the bridge. This is an increase of 113% loading on the bridge. So when comparing the structural impact on the bridge, the crane has 51% more impact than the HML road train. So if we move to the next example on a 20 metre span, the three, axle, three triaxle groups of the HML road train can fit on the bridge, hence the 67 and a half tonne loading on the bridge. The crane is lighter at 48 tonne, which is uh, a decrease of 29% of load on the bridge. But when comparing the structural impact on the bridge, the crane has 9% more impact than the HML road train. And this is due to compact nature of the crane, like a point load on a simply supported bridge. The message here is that no bridge is the same, no bridge span is the same. Different vehicles with different dimension and axle loads have different distributions of load across a bridge span. And that's why some of our permit decisions may seem counterintuitive at times. The other takeaway is that class one vehicles have higher structural impact on bridges than class two vehicles. So if I move to the next slide, um, this um, I suppose shows that it's some examples of where it's manifesting an impact on some of our older bridge, bridge docks. So we are seeing problems that we're having to deal with on a more regular basis with a number of bridges. So a few examples up here, you may or may not be aware of the Bill Press Bridge in um, Gladstone, cracking in the halving joints. Um, We've got uh, timber bridge deck issues in, in Wide Bay Burnett district with um, some of our timber bridges. Cut Creek Bridge, um, deck holes needing to be covered from re repetitions of large loads on, on that bridge. One that um, we've been really um, working really hard to, to make more sustainable has been the B Creek Bridge and the deck nosing here breaking off due to rep repetitions of large loads on it. Um, and we've been putting a lot of um, monitoring equipment in place to keep a close eye on what's happening with that bridge. We've, um, we've had significant concerns around that bridge. Alice River Bridge um, on the Landsborough Highway, cracking near the bearing from repetitive large loads. So you can see that um, from our older bridge, a number of our older bridges are struggling to cope with the overstressing they're experiencing. You may well say they aren't, you know, why aren't we maintaining them? Well, we have an extensive maintenance program, but the fact is, as we pointed out earlier, many of these bridges were not designed to take the loads that they're currently taking. So we do need to, um, to really pay attention. And that's hence um, a primary reason why we're undertaking this review of the class one access regime. So if I now sort of go into a, a bit of the, um, on the next slide and talk a little bit about the, the engineering theory and try and simplify it in a sense, I suppose, about what we're looking at in terms of our responsibilities as um, RPQ engineers, and we are obliged under 
the Professional Engineers Act and also under the Workplace Health and Safety Act that we do um, act responsibly here. And so um, our current access regime, um, a lot, some aspects of our current access regime are clearly not supported by the structural analysis that's been undertaken by my structural engineers. So this graph provides an example of where the current regime allows access class one vehicles beyond the assessed capacity of their structures. As the load becomes higher, the, the more the bridge feels it, so greater the stress on the bridge. Also, the higher the load, the fewer the crossings that um, it takes to, until permanent damage can be caused. So in summary, we recognise we have a risk here and responsible road managers, we need, are obliged to address that issue, as I said. There, there is where we need, this is where we need to work with you and industry to understand how we can manage the challenge together um, around how we manage these um, bridges that are experiencing this stress. And this why, is why we've set up the class one access regime um, project. Um, we will, through the review, also be seeking to align wherever possible um, with New South Wales and Victoria, um, being very conscious of taking a national approach wherever we can. So the dilemma we're faced with, TMR is required to manage risk for all road users due to overstress to our infrastructure. The majority of our bridges were not designed for modern day class one vehicle fleet. Although we constantly improve our network, and I think the figure that um, Jeff quoted was, you know, replacing a bridge every two weeks or building a new bridge every two weeks over the last 20 years is, um, is a testament to that we are um, really um, replacing bridges where we can and we're also undertaking significant maintenance. But each bridge does have a finite capacity. TMR is undertaking extensive assessment, um, which has revealed that some elements of our current access regime is not supported by the structural analysis take, undertaken by our RPQ engineers. The access regime or the current access regime was based on um, 1987 and um, was established in 1987 based on 1970s engineering knowledge at that, that time. And since this time, there has been a significant development in the type of class one vehicles in the marketplace and as well as uh, industry vehicle of choice and loading behaviour. Many of the vehicles that are operating today did not exist or were very rare when the current access regime was first developed. There's also been a significant reduction in the operational risks that underpin the original access regime. So those risk me measures that we had in place have gradually been relaxed and, um, and, and move, we've moved away from those. Um, so we do need to understand for some bridges whether we need some of those um, conditions of operations um, um, in place to manage that risk. So the current access regime and framework is not consistent with what we know of our engineering. Um, so we are obliged to undertake this project. But as um, Jeff said, we um, really need to do this in concert with industry because we know how important um, this access is to industry and also to the health of the Queensland economy. So going forward, um, Balancing access for class one heavy vehicles and the need to manage road assets effectively is the role that um, we take very seriously here at the Department of Transport and Main Roads. As a responsible road manager, TMR are compelled to ensure access for all road users is safe and sustainable, and the department complies with the re relevant the regulatory and legislative requirements, as I mentioned. Consequently, the department has formed a dedicated program team to develop a new class one access regime and optimise the access to TMR structures for all road users. The program team is identifying necessary challenges and will work with the industry to optimise opportunities to improve and to reduce any impacts. We've recently completed some exciting work with um, SECA, Crane Industry Council, um, which has made it easier for the, their members and operators. And we've really worked through some of the issues that we're also going to face with low loaders and platforms with the crane industry. So we're not starting from a zero base. We've got some, certainly got some lessons that we've got out of that process. So our, now our focus will be moving to those load carrying vehicles. So in um, moving forward, there are a set of agreed principles that um, have been agreed by our executive leadership team, which is the board that um, oversees TMR, um, chaired by the Director General. 
and they're listed on the slide there. I won't run through all of them, but um, a couple of really critical ones for us is to ensure we facilitate industry while responsibly managing risk to the structure and all road users. Um, and we need a regime that's supported by engineering. But um, these are the principles that we'll be moving forward with. And we're even open to discussing if there's some principles that um, that might be missing as we move forward in our consultative process. So if we now look at the actual work program, um, the work program moving forward through to mid 2024 is the timeline for this project. And we'll be working with industry to deliver uh, industry access to network in a safe and sustainable way, improve systems and processes for managing class one heavy vehicles, uh, increase transparency and certainty around access to assist industry with doing business. So I think Jeff mentioned we need to um, certainly make our information more accessible and transparent so you and industry can make your decisions in, in a more informed way. And it's in no one's interest to um, having to put in multiple permits on the premise that some of them come way. If we can provide you with the tools in which to do those assessments, self-assessment before lodging, um, that will um, be, be better for everybody. So to achieve these outcomes for the project um, and the program, the functions have been split across five key areas. Our governance framework, um, our mode access regime, our SPV, special purpose vehicle access regime, technology including compliance and enforcement um, technology to give us greater certainty where it's critical on some of our structures that are most at risk and process and system enhancements. And I alluded to those in terms of how we can do better in terms of making information more accessible. So in terms of um, project priorities, throughout the life of the project, we'll be collaborating with industry to facilitate transparency and certainty about access. Um, this will be achieved through the development of a new access framework and guidance maps for both load carrying and special purpose vehicles to help provide a far more interactive tool set that the operators can use to pre-plan and assess what configuration can move where prior to applying for access. We'll be developing a compliance and enforcement strategy, as I mentioned, to support the new regime. This piece of work seeks to improve compliance, to safeguard the integrity of our structures, as well as provide an even playing field for all operators. This will leverage available technologies. And I've got to say, our work um, with uh, our colleagues in SICA, um, has been very supportive in this space, um, ensuring that um, we get as high compliance as we possibly can and that everybody has, is playing to the same set of rules. We will also be taking advantage of learnings from others, especially other jurisdictions and how they provide class one vehicles. And as I said before, we'll harmonise wherever we possibly can. We understand the importance to industry that, um, you know, state boundaries are an artifice really the industry moves across um, state boundaries routinely and we need consistency wherever we possibly can. We also understand there is an interest for a national online system to make business easier for industry and we'll be actively participating and pursuing um, and supporting where we can a solution that makes it um, much, much easier for industry to get the information they need irrespective of where they're moving around um, this um, great country. I hope this gives you a comprehensive overview of why TMR has initiated this program of work. I know the project is monitoring the chat box, and so they'll be answering questions, any questions you've, you've got wherever possible, and they'll try and provide you an answer today or they'll follow up in due course. But um, I'd just like to reiterate, and I, you know, we have set this program team up across the department. I'd like to thank Jeff for his cooperation from his part of the organisation, but this is a uh, one TMR approach. We are joined up and we're, we're certainly um, coming together to work with industry to, um, to meet some of the challenges that we face, but I think um, I'm confident um, that we can meet those challenges together. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis, and thank you, Jeff, for making the time. Um, to join us today and present um, those important slides. So from here, um, there is a, a several ways you can actually become involved in being part of this program, being part of the future of the access regime here in Queensland. 
So throughout the course of this program, we'll be doing several uh, industry working groups where we invite industry members in to be part of the working group and to work through our solutions and, and guide us as we go. So from today, we'll be calling for all representatives for the load carrying industry working group, which we'll be getting set up um, as the first working group. Later on in the year, we'll be setting up an SPV working group for the special purpose vehicle operators to also come in as a working group and focus on the special purpose vehicle work we're going to be doing um, later on in, in the program. So the low carrying industry working group, uh, the aim of that, the working group, and, and it is the same with the SPV working group, is for for the members of the working group, for everyone to bring their respective knowledge and industry representation um, into the group and to contribute. We hope that they'll provide direct input into the program deliverables and ensure that there are no unreasonable impacts on industry while we while still meeting uh, our obligations um, that TMR have in place through various mechanisms. Mechanisms, sorry. Um, the meetings will be held periodically. Um, we will aim to use Microsoft Teams for those meetings so people don't have to travel. We want to make sure we give everyone every opportunity to uh, to be part of it. And they'll be held um, in conjunction with the program team when we have things to work through with the working group and as part of the program. Time-wise for commitment, we're, we're looking at approximately two hours per fortnight um, as a commitment, and that may not be meetings, that may be uh, input or feedback or you know some things we may need to work in group to to take away and discuss with their other industry partners and and come back to the program with with some advice and some responses. Each working group will have a terms of reference um, that each member of the working group will have to agree to and, and that allows it to have clarity over the roles and responsibilities and expectations for all involved for, for every single party so everyone is clear and we can we can produce some really good results out of the working group. So how can you nominate? So nominations are now open via our program web page. Uh, the nominations will use a form and that will have a, a series of selection criteria so that we can ensure we get a balanced representation for this working group. It's important to the program, it's important to TMR that we have broad representation from all of industry, whether that be your smaller mum and dad operations right through to your, to your medium sized operators that do a bit of everything, right up to your large operators that do a really big heavy stuff on the network. It's also important to have industry representation that is balanced in line with the, with the industry input so that we can get a broad and holistic understanding from industry. You'll be able to nominate using the form, which I'll show you very, very shortly how to access that. We've made it as simple as we possibly can. Nominations for the low carrying working group will close on Sunday, the 14th of August. From there, the team will review all the applications and I hope we get, I hope we get plenty given um, the interest in the class one space. And we'll be reviewing those so that we can have representation and membership that is representative of the industry here in Queensland. So in order to nominate uh, for the working group, we have our revised program page that sits on the business Queensland inside the heavy vehicle space. So if you've ever gone in to do an IAP enrollment, you go to a very similar location, but you'll see a page there for the program. Um, we will also send out some information to people in attendance so you can get to it more easily. Now to enrol you, you or to nominate, I should say, you just click on the nominate for load carrying vehicle working group. That will load up a form for you to go through and complete. So very normal, simple stuff, your contact emails so we can so we can contact you and give you the good news. As well as whether you're a company or an association. And from there, the form will guide you through providing some very basic information so we can we can determine where you where you fit in and we can make sure we have a balance of operators. So we are not we are not large operator heavy and we are not small operator heavy. We are just we have a good balance and a good representation. Once you submit that, that will come through to the program team and we'll work through it and we'll provide responses from there as we go along inside the program. Additionally, we have a, a newsletter 
service that has been set up. So if you if you are not part of the working group, or even if you are and you want to be kept up to date with what's happening um, in this space, we have a newsletter service set up that you can click on and subscribe to and be part of. Additionally, there's also the option if you haven't already to subscribe to the existing heavy vehicle notifications so you can be kept up to date with what's happening on the network. And as I said, the nomination to the working group. This page here, our program page will get updated periodically over time and will start to include things such as frequently asked questions and more detailed information if we have it as we have it. So it will be a thing that's updated over time and over the course of the program so that you can come here and get the information that you need as an industry representative and understand where we're up to. Again, the, the, the link is there. I don't ask you to try and copy that. You don't have to. We'll get some information out to everyone on to how you can access that. Um, the, the industry emailing list and, and newsletter that we put together will be important for everyone as we go throughout the course of this program and we'll, we'll share our key learnings as we can. There will also be some stuff shared through our normal channels um, through LinkedIn and, and things like that. So that brings us to an end um, of where we are now. There is a, a few questions um, inside the, the Q&A inside the chat and the team are working through responding to those at the moment. Um, there, there will be some that we will defer to and we'll provide a response as time goes on. So if your question hasn't been answered today, um, please don't stress on that. We have the question, um, we have who's asked it, so we will get back to you. The program team will provide you with a timely response as we go along throughout that. So that realistically brings us to an end of where we are. Um, we thank you very, very much for your time. It's good to give people time back in their day, especially first thing in the morning on the Thursday. So that's a very good start for all of us. Um, so thank you again to Jeff. Thank you again to Dennis. Um, and your support and attendance and words have been very welcome. Thank, thank you. Very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, we'll let you get on with your day. There'll be some more information coming out to you very shortly. Please do nominate to become involved. We are very much looking forward to um, having you as part of this program and working with you. So thank you very much and good morning. <laughs>